can hear you. Okay, you can. So um, we're, I'd like to welcome everybody. I'm uh, Stephen Stewart. I'm the president of the Genealogical Research Society of New Orleans. And we're, this is our, our inaugural um, presentation on Facebook Live. Uh, we're happy to have those of you who are watching us on Facebook Live tonight. Uh, we have a, a Zoom meeting that we've arranged with our, some of our members of the organization, and we have a special guest speaker tonight, uh, Tyler Bridges, who is going to um, kind of take us through his most recent book that he's published and some of the research behind that. Um, but before we get started, I just wanted to tell everyone a little bit about the Genealogical Research Society of New Orleans. Uh, Stephen, just a second. Tyler says he's not hearing anything. But, okay. But I hear you clearly. Okay. Let's see if we can just check the audio. Um, okay. Okay, you can hear us, Tyler? I'm good now. Okay, okay great, great, okay. Sorry. That's okay, that's okay. Um, so we wanted to just tell, tell everyone a little bit about um, the Genealogical Research Society of New Orleans. We're, an organization that's been around for um, more than six decades. We started in 1960, and it's an organization of individuals who are dedicated to genealogical research, and particularly research in the that relates to Louisiana Gulf Coast and um, family history in those in those areas. And it's we publish a a journal three times a year uh, called New Orleans Genesis, which is distributed to our members. And it's, it's, an or it's a publication that has also been around as long as the organization has. And it publishes works that are some of our members do as well as uh, guest authors that we, you know, we have from time to time. And it's included in your membership with GRSNO. Um, it provides some great resources, not just on you know, stories about family history, how various members of GRSNO did their research, but also it publishes records that have a connection to families in Louisiana and the Gulf Coast. So it's a, it's a resource for future um, researchers as they delve into their own family trees. We have a lot of these, um, I think we have almost, we have all issues now online uh, on our website at www.grsno.org, and uh, members have access to those um, those journals. We also uh, have these meetings uh, several times a year. So it's one of the ben benefits of becoming a member is that you get invited to join in on these special presentations that we have to um, inform and educate ourselves on genealogical research and local history and family history. Uh, we hold three meetings um, during, the, during the spring and three in the fall. And during the pandemic, we've been on Zoom to uh, stay in touch with each other. And we're happy tonight to be able to take this um, to Facebook Live with, you know, with Tyler Bridges as our guest speaker tonight. Um, just to tell you a little bit about about Tyler, and then I'll hand it off to him. Is um, Tyler is a, a journalist. He's been uh, worked for many years. You've probably seen his work throughout the Times Picayune and the Advocate for a number of years. He's also written several books um, on Louisiana politics, um, and his most recent book, which is not political, it's actually the topic of tonight's conversation is um, a book about his father's military service during World War II. And it's a fascinating book that goes in, that tells um, this amazing story of how his father survived uh, being shot down over Austria in World War II and his sort of tale of survival to um, make it back to uh, an allied base in Italy. And so it's, it's really an interesting, um, and fascinating story of how, um, you know, how, how this one 
person with help from a number of different people throughout that that saga uh, made it through and and also it's you know a story of how Tyler did the research to find out that what happened uh, which we'll hear hear about tonight um, another other things I would mention is that um, that you know this Tyler's book is available on amazon.com and we've included a link on our Facebook page so if you you know, want to learn more about the presentation tonight and you know get the full story I mean definitely check out the book it's really uh, a terrific read and it really um, you know, just an amazing story of how how he made it through that era uh, so I'll go ahead and and turn this over to Tyler we actually have him just for an hour tonight uh, until eight o'clock so we'll have to have a hard stop at eight o'clock um, but I wanted to just remind everyone that you know, the presentation that you'll hear tonight and the lecture and the slides that Tyler may present are his copyrighted material. And we just ask that you don't reproduce or share them without his uh, written permission. So with that, I will uh, turn it over to you, Tyler, and thank you again for taking the time tonight to be with us. Yeah, hey, thanks, Stephen, and, and greetings to everybody. Uh, um, it's always humbling when people who have a lot of things they could do uh, show up to hear, hear you talk. So uh, thanks for uh, taking the time to hear me tonight. I'll just take a couple of minutes to tell you about um, about who I am. Um, originally from California near San Francisco. Uh, spent some time in South America. I freelanced my way through South America. Um, I did not want to return to the United States uh, after my four years of South America. So I moved to New Orleans um, in 1989. And the biggest story at the time was uh, uh, the election of David Duke. So my editors assigned me to him. So I began investigating Duke and did a lot of the stuff on him. The new stuff that came out was very damaging to him and turned that into my first book, The Rise of David Duke. The big story then in New Orleans in the early 90s was the legalization of gambling. Did a lot of stuff on that, um, upset some people. <laughs> and that led to my next book called Bad Bet on the Bayou. Um, and then uh, I ended up doing a... Um, I ended up going to uh, the Miami Herald for a number of years, went back to South America, um, and then came back to Louisiana and missed being in New Orleans and being in Louisiana, and um, uh, covered the 2015 governor's race for the advocate. Uh, I, and by the way, I spent a year at Harvard on something called a Neiman Fellowship, where you get uh, a year at Harvard and they, they pay you and you study anything you want. And uh, 2015 back in Louisiana at the advocate now, and uh, wrote a book on the 2015 governor's race where John Bell Edwards uh, was the long shot to win that race and that book is called Long Shot. And then I updated my Duke book. Now I called it The Rise and Fall of David Duke. Um, and now I've got this book out and, and, and right at the end, maybe I'll tell you, if I have time to tell you about my new book. So here's the book I guess I'll talk about tonight. I'll hold it up if you haven't seen it, um, called The Flight. Uh, a father's war, a son's search. And um, I, I would not tell you that I am a um, sort of a genealogical person. Um, I take on topics and I, I dig into them and I'm very tenacious. I'm very, I get, I dig, 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 dig. And um, I, I wouldn't claim I know all the tricks, um, but I guess maybe I sort of learn them along the way, whatever I'm working on. And uh, this book about my father um, began at his funeral, uh, which was in 2003. And um, I should mention uh, my father and mother had seven children. And I was the youngest of the, of the seven children, maybe the, the most precocious of them uh, for many years, was the only one who lived outside of California of the seven kids. And when my father uh, at his funeral, I was the one that sort of was the MC and, and talked and and um, and I was I was talking about him and listening to my siblings talk about him. I, I realized that I did not know the most important part of his life, which was his service during World War II, and I resolved uh, that I would then begin trying to find out it. So again, he died in in 2003, and then 2008, I had a, a one week fellowship at uh, Stanford University. And I decided I would spend that week getting started 
and beginning to understand his story. So uh, I'm a journalist, you know, but I'm also an author. And I guess I was thinking back in 2008, wouldn't it be neat to, to know my dad's story just for myself, just for my family of this, you know, seminal event in his life. Uh, but I also thought, you know, could it possibly be a book? I didn't think so. And one of the things I, I, I came to understand, I guess, along the way was in better understanding my, my, my dad, it would help me better understand myself and where did I come from? And I think that's, um, are we still good? Yes, we're still good. Okay, sorry. So in understanding uh, myself, I would answer kind of that, that question I think all of us have at one point or another, where do we come from? And so um, I, be, I, I typically, when I take a big topic on, I sort of start far away and then I just kind of work closer and closer to the topic. And in this case, I didn't even know what plane my dad had flown, uh, but I learned that it, quickly that it was a B-24 bomber. Uh, there was sort of two main bombers during World War II, B-17s and B-24s. And I learned that uh, there was still what's called a bomb group. My dad belonged to a bomb group, the 44th bomb group. And they were still active, right? They were right at the, the end of their, their tenure. So I was fortunate to begin the research when I did. And I wrote to the secretary, trying to, to uh, find out uh, who else was on his crew. Um, my dad was the pilot of the plane, and there was nine other men on the plane. Um, when, and I learned that the plane took off on October 1st, 1943, on what turned out to be um, the final mission of a plane called the Fascinating Witch. And so I wrote the uh, secretary of the 44th Bomb Group, and she gave me addresses of, of sort of last known addresses of the crew members, and I wrote them. And it was very disheartening at first because I got letters back, um, you know, no longer alive, deceased, um, no longer at this address. And it turned out that the members of my dad's crew, there was only one of them still alive. And I was, I was able to eventually talk to him. But I just began um, doing a lot of research online and discovered uh, there's a lot of information online about um, on the web that you can go. Um, just different places about World War II and uh, um, just dug deeper and deeper and deeper and, and uh, learned that the National um, Archives, what is it, NARA, just outside of Washington, D.C. Um, I, I wrote to them and, and, and trying to find out more and sort of wondering, you know, where, where had my dad gone? And, and you know, if you've done any research, there's, there might be a moment, if you're lucky, where, like, you hit the lottery. <laughs> well, I hit the lottery when I got this big, thick envelope back from the uh, National Archives, and it contained my dad's story, as he told it, um, just after um, he had uh, um, gotten to safety. And then that then became the basis of, of more and more research. And as I mentioned, I'm, I'm very tenacious. And I began, I, in fact, I was living in South America at the time. I was a foreign correspondent for the Miami Herald newspaper. And I did a lot of research from South America, um, just looking up stuff online, sending out all sorts of emails. Um, one person leads you to another person, leads you to another person. That's a dry hole. This one's a dry hole. You send it to another person, bingo. They know something and they put you in touch with someone else. Oh, and by the way, have you read this book? Um, and at one point, um, somebody, I, I began posting stuff on um, websites, um, what they call message boards about World War II. And somebody, a guy in New Zealand saw uh, a post of mine. Uh, you know, I sort of, the more, it's almost, I'm not a fisherman, but it's almost like the more lines you have in the river, you know, the more chances you're going to catch the fish. So, um, a guy in New Zealand reached out to me and said, Cannot see. What's that? Okay. So uh, said, have you, uh, I can put you in touch with Di Davies. Well, and it turned out that, that Di Davies was a, was a guy um, from Wales who had escaped with my father in Yugoslavia. And he was about 90 years old. And I soon found myself on the phone with Di Davies. 
And it was like, you know, again, another incredible moment where the first thing he said to me was, I saved your father's life. <laughs> so, you know, by saving my father's life, he made, made my life possible. So I, I ended up doing a lot of research and, and, and took me uh, uh, time to write the book. And uh, ultimately, I faced sort of a conundrum of uh, the book wasn't working and I had to figure out, you know, how to make it work. Uh, which I'd be happy to talk about, but I would rather not talk too long. Um, I'm used to covering politicians and a lot of them talk too long. <laughs> and sometimes it, I hear speakers speak too long. And what I'd rather do is um, hopefully I've sparked a question or of an area of interest that one of you want to talk about. Um, so let me stop right now. Um, but just say, again, I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to talk about um, this book and, and in which I you know, honor my father and, and, uh, the brave men who fought for our country during World War II. Um, so Tyler, I might just maybe to start. Uh, how how much did when your father was alive? How much of the story had you heard? Um, and what like what pieces did you know? And then what uh, what didn't you know at that time? Sure, no, that's a, that's a great question, Stephen. Um, I, I've run into a lot of people. Um, when the book is out, they, they tell me that, you know, their father um, never talked about the war, or maybe right at the end of, an, end of his life, he did talk about the war. My dad was actually different. When I said at his funeral that the, um, I knew that the war had been a seminal event in his life, and, and that's because um, I had heard him tell stories. Um, my sisters had all heard him tell stories about World War II as well. And um, we all sort of knew the basic stories. We knew of a story of him trying to escape Hungary and get across the river into Yugoslavia and that, the, and that the boatman sold him out. I'm sorry, I'm getting a call. Let me just tell this person, I'll call him back. Oh, well. Um, he, um, he looked back on the war in, in sort of fond terms. And again, um, it was such an important part of his life. Um, he was a bomber pilot um, at age 22 years old, if you can believe it, in charge of a crew of 10 men, including himself, making decisions about life and death. Um, so Stephen, I knew the basic stories that he used to tell us. Um, what I learned in my research, there was so much that he didn't, he didn't tell me and my, my siblings. Um, the stories about death, um, the stories about, uh, there was a decision he made that ultimately led to the death of some other men. Um, he never told us that story as well. Um, and I sort of have this eternal regret now that he's gone. And I, you know, again, I did not begin the research until after his death. But I so wish that uh, um, when I was much younger, when he was still active, that, uh, that we didn't take time to, to go to Europe and, and maybe follow the, the trail, which I ended up doing many, you know, after his death. Um, Casey, did you have a question? Yes. Uh, Tyler, to what extent did the fire in the St. Louis Records Depot uh, hamper your research? Yeah, for those of you who don't know, one of the, the key places to get information is um, was this uh, uh, record center in St. Louis. And, and a lot of the stuff, the records were burned uh, and the records that I wanted for my dad were not available in, in St. Louis. So it did hamper me there. Um, but a funny thing about archives is that stuff can be in many different places. And in my case, again, as I mentioned, the, um, the hitting the lottery was these records on my dad um, at the National Archives. And it, it actually even turned out that those records were uh, online, which it, I didn't realize for a while. But other researchers who knew about this um, good, did it. Maybe I'll, I'll tell you something that I learned. Um, and those of you who are pros will already know this. But you know there are people out there who, who already know how to do some of this stuff. So if you can find those people, um, you don't have to invent the wheel yourself. They, they, they will help you. And a, a nice thing of people who have done you know, good research so frequently, they will uh, help you themselves. But um, I actually ended up doing getting research all over the world, our archives. Um, and my book, I have a, a photograph of a, a 
a Gestapo document that I got in Serbia. Um, I paid a researcher, and if anybody ever needs a researcher in London, I've got a great researcher who, um, what's called the Kew Gardens. He found amazing stuff for me on my dad and some other people I was looking for. I got some stuff from the archives in South Africa. Hungary particularly was helpful. Uh, stuff from New Zealand, um, Australia. Uh, there are some just really great librarians and researchers out there who are happy to help you out if, if you can find them. Can you tell us a little bit about the, I guess, some of the individuals who helped you along the way? Um, and you mentioned the, some researchers you contacted in, in, in Europe. Um, who, how did you make those connections? And were there any couple of people who really kind of stood out to you as, as very instrumental? Um, I don't know that I would cite anybody, although again, this researcher I, I hired in, 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 in England was very, very good. You know, of course I paid him. Um, uh, you know, I think librarians are people who um, want to help. And if you can find them, um, they'll help you do this stuff. Um, one of the things that I found, one of the tricks that I found that was very helpful Again, maybe some of you already know this, is finding somebody's obituary. Um, I was trying to, uh, a, a guy who died on my dad's plane, he never told us about it, was named Jack Rosenstein. And I wanted to find Jack Rosenstein's family. And I, was, I learned that Jack Rosenstein was from Hartford, Connecticut. So I called the called or emailed the public library in Hartford, uh, Connecticut, and told them uh, about Jack Rosenstein. And so they found his uh, uh, obituary from you know, when he died aboard my dad's plane and that identified the parents. And then they were able to look up the parents' obituaries and I was able to learn about the, the, that, you know, particularly the, there was a son who was still around. And that's why I was, I had this very strange thing where I called a man named Jerry Rosenstein early on in my research, and I said that uh, um, you know, was he Jack Rosenstein's brother? And I said, you know, he had been on my dad's plane. And I said, you know, this this is going to be sort of a strange call. And he, he yelled out to his, "Hey, I got this guy on the phone. Says he he's researching that you know the death of my brother Jack." And then anyway, Jerry Rosenstein ended up help, being very helpful. And he ended up sending me information um, from their family, um, Jewish family, Jack Rosenstein. And the mother had, had never believed that Jack Rosenstein had died um, aboard my dad's plane. And it spent a number of years during the war and after the war um, searching through hospitals, thinking that he had hit his head and, and suffered amnesia. Um, and my call and the research that I did led the Rosensteins, uh, by now the mother is dead, but the, uh, the brother and his children uh, to finally understand, yeah, the brother had indeed died and that helped them with various um, services they would do in, in, the, in the Jewish faith. Um, that was kind of a neat thing that, that came out of um, the research that I did for the book. Okay, um, if anyone has questions, I mean, feel free to just raise is your there hand. Something in this, is there something in the chat area or that was already done? I think um, we, we have, um, you know, if you want to raise your hand or click the raised hand button, uh, I can call on you. Um, uh, Richard? Yeah. yeah, well, you mentioned that you had found libraries and, and uh, I think you said New Zealand and South Africa that had records that pertain to your father. Yeah. Uh, how did, how does that work on uh, they're getting military records from America or I understand the European records because he was in Europe during the war. Some records would be generated there. But right. These are records that record wind up in those other countries so all the way on the south and southern hemisphere. Right. So um, the records on my dad's crew, those were all Americans. And I, you know, I, I tried to find information on each of the crew members. I remember one guy 
And I never really got very much information on who died on my dad's plane. Uh, I contacted the West, he was from West Virginia, the West Virginia Historical Society, and they did some good research, but they were not able to find very much. Another guy who died on my dad's plane, he was from Iowa, and I, I contacted the local town where he was from. They found his obituary, um, and I was able to talk to uh, a brother of his and fill in some details about this guy. But the guys overseas, um, why I wanted to go to Australia and New Zealand was because my dad became a prisoner of war and he had becoming a prisoner of war sure. with uh, guys from New Zealand, Australia. And so I ended up uh, contacting the, um, the, the archives, military archives in those countries. And one of the things that also happened along the way, um, just you know, serendipitously, and during my research, I'd, I'd come across something and I learned there was a book I needed to read. Um, there was a, an, it turned out there was an English major who played an important role in keeping my dad and the others alive. And it turned out that this guy wrote a book about his time with the partisans in Yugoslavia um, <clears throat> named uh, Basil Davidson. So I was able to find through some like overseas um, used book service, a copy of this book and Davidson did not write about my dad specifically in his book, but he wrote about stuff that I was able to identify that he was writing about a specific incident that involved my father. So I was able to include what, what Davidson wrote about in my, in my book. And then Davidson wrote another book later on that I was able to reference. And then at some other point, I learned about this Australian guy had written a book about who had been a prisoner of war with my father. Again, I don't know that they knew each other. Um, and I learned about a pilot um, who was held at the same time with my dad. He didn't remember my dad. They were held together in Hungary. And I found that guy. Um, he was still alive. He no longer is. But he was able to talk about um, the place where they were held, which was actually a castle in Hungary. Um, so there's just uh, many, many trails. And, and any of you who do the research, you know the importance of not getting discouraged. I, I have a theory that um, you create your own luck. Um, I'm a lucky person, but, but um, what is the phrase? Luck is the residue of design. Is that what the phrase is? That if you try enough doors, um, more doors will open, right? And so um, went down a lot of uh, um, dead ends, but um, I went down a lot of other trails that, that led to more and more uh, things. So um, anyway. I think, um, Amy, uh, Amy, Hi. I think you yeah. might have Hi. I, I, my screen is all messed up, but I just want to know how, how did you handle the, the language barrier with the Hungarians, et cetera? Right. Yeah. And I also got some documents in German. <clears throat> I was actually living in Peru of all places at the time as a foreign correspondent. And, uh, I knew a guy, I, I had become friends with a German guy. So he was able to translate the documents for me. And my mother had a friend who was Hungarian. So she was able to translate some of the stuff that was written in Hungarian. And, and she had another friend who was French. Um, and so she translates some documents that I had that were in French. So um, again, it's just, um, just not giving up. It's just uh, trying to be very, very resourceful. Um, whatever shortcomings I have, I'm a pretty resourceful person finding somebody who could be helpful and not being shy about asking for help. And that's great. Um, Thank you. Uh, well, why don't, we, why don't we go to Jack and then to Casey? Or Jack, you're muted. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, no, the question I had of the 10 people who were on the plane when it was shot down or who managed to, to, to hit the ground, how many of them survived that and then went on to either being uh, chased, arrested, or whatever? So a B-24 had 10 men aboard. Again, my dad was the captain. Uh, and he was the pilot. He was in charge. Um, and um, the plane took off on October 1st, 1943, as I mentioned, took off from Tunis, Tunisia, 
the Allies had just taken over northern Italy, um, I'm sorry, northern uh, Africa. And uh, it was the second time they were bombing uh, uh, Austria. Uh, uh, and they, they were bombing that day a city called Wiener Neustadt. And um, just as uh, I'm going to answer your question, Jack, but I'm going to digress a little bit. Um, people who read my book, they, they talk about how they feel like they're there. And that's why I was able to find some other members of my dad's um, bomb group, including some pilots, and they were able to give me a description. And again, the way I work, I, I, I think I did some interviews like 10 or 12 times. I would go back to people um, explaining to me what's the yoke and, and, uh, and on the airplane um, that, that you, that's you know, between your legs as the pilot. And tell me, tell me what was the scene about getting woken up in the morning and tell me about breakfast. Tell me through the ritual, step step by step, before you get on the plane. So, um, if any of you pick up the book, hopefully you'll you'll feel like you're there that morning as the men are getting ready. You'll feel like you're on the plane um, as they're taking off on that last fateful mission. But again, ten guys. Uh, you have the the pilot sitting to his right is the um, co-pilot. You have a flight engineer, you have a bombardier, you have a navigator. Um, you got a couple guys or just three guys who are nothing but gunners. Um, bombardier, navigator, I, th I think that's 10. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, my dad used to tell stories about his war experiences. But as I learned during the research, and I learned this very early, was that three guys on the plane died. Um, and um, my dad's plane, as I, I tell, I tell the story in the book, um, hopefully in vivid detail, um, when the plane is, it gets hit like that and, and, and the pilot knows it has no chance, um, he rings up, I think it rings a bell or pushes an intercom or something that I can't remember right now to let everybody know that you got to get off the plane. And it turned out my dad's plane was on got caught on fire. Um, and the pilot's responsibility of, on the plane is to hold the plane steady while everybody gets off. Now, I was fortunate um, to be able to fly on a B-24 about 10 years ago while I was working on the book for something called the Collings Foundation. And they, were, they, would, they let me go up on a B-24 and it's just, <laughs> has anybody else been on a B-24? It's incredibly how incredible how um, the windows are open. You know, you're flying at eighteen thousand feet. You're you're extremely cold. One can imagine that we didn't go that high when I flew with it. Um, to get from one plane or the other, one part of the plane or the other, you have to end up kind of walking over this catwalk over the bomb bay. And just to get that from there to the pilot's area, you almost have to sort of uh, um, put your leg up and kind of pull yourself up. I and mean, it's just remarkable how difficult it was uh, to be on that plane. And yet, um, and how difficult it was, I think, for my dad when he gives the, the bailout signal um, to the other men, get off the plane immediately. And he didn't know what was going on in the back of the plane. He just knew the plane was on fire. He didn't know that men had died. So there are, um, uh, so he knows that these men are getting off the plane. He can, I think, turn around and all of a sudden, it, you know, it's him and the co-pilot. The co-pilot um, is a man named Del Phelps and, and De Del now is gonna get off the plane. He is, he's got his legs hanging over the bomb bay, the open bit where, you know, where the bomb, uh, had been dropped and he's going to drop out, but he turns around and says, my dad's name is Richard, but he says, Dick, you know, get the hell off the plane. Uh, it's a ticking time bomb. And so um, my dad, um, he had his regular army boots, but he didn't like to fly them because uh, without the um, pressure there, they would get too tight and they would hurt his feet. You know, the plane he had to fly that plane for hours to the target and then hours back. And so he, he had another pair of boots on that he used when he flew, but they were kind of loose. And at that moment, um, he had those loose boots on and he knew that if he jumped out of the plane, he'd lose his boots. So Dell sees my dad 
get about to get off the, you know, Dell's jumping off the plane. It, it's it's going to explode any moment. And he sees my dad trying to change back into his old shoes, you know, his, his tighter shoes. And literally the plane exploded with my dad aboard the plane. And I know this from the, from the, the account that he gave later. So um, he somehow survives the explosion of the plane and he ends up parachuting down and he's now south of the town of Vienna Neustadt, which itself is south of Vienna. Um, and I, you know, again, as part of my research, I even I was able to find someone that made an estimate of how long it would have taken my dad uh, to parachute from 15,000 feet, which was, I think it was about the level he was at. But to ultimately answer your question, Jack, um, so three guys died, six guys were caught um, on the ground and became prisoners of war for the rest of the war. And my dad um, was not caught in, in Austria. But, but he became the first American prisoner of war during World War II in Hungary. That was my dad's, uh, um, he, I don't remember him ever telling me that, but I learned it through my research that he uh, um, had that uh, position. Um. Why don't we remind you, Casey, and then Colin. Uh, Casey, you're muted. You're muted. Okay, now, I'm sorry. I'm not very technologically capable. Uh, Tyler, did you have any interaction with the World War II Museum. Uh, they have a section that helps with research and they did some research for me and um, I didn't get exactly what I was looking for. And they, they blamed it on the St. Louis fire. Um, but I'm really enthused to hear that you contacted the National Archives directly and um, but what about the museum? Did you have any interaction with them? Yeah, and by the word, uh, by the way, so not only did I write the National Archives, and and again they found this treasure trove uh, of my dad that I'm sure I don't know if anybody ever requested it before. I also went to the National Archives. Um, I spent four days there. Um, if you're going to go there, I think it's it's good to give yourself extra time because it takes a while just to kind of figure out how things work there and you have to take, it takes a little while to register there. So if you're only planning one day, you better know, um, you'll, you better not be looking for very much. So again, I found, I spent four days there and I'm sort of old fashioned. I made a lot of photocopies. Um, I guess these days someone might just take pictures of, of what they have. Um, by the time I sort of rolled around to thinking about the World War II Museum, I, I actually had just about everything I needed. I did contact them. I remember when I went to a couple of lectures there, I actually lived nearby where they were there located. And, uh, um, but I really didn't need very much because I had done so much research on my own. I kind of surpassed what they could do for me. And my, and my questions were very, very specific about you know, things that they, that they would probably not um, no, but let, me, but let me give a shout out to the World War II Museum, if I may. Um, this is what Rob Satino, who is their senior historian, this is what he said about my book. He said, this book has it all, a handsome American flyboy in World War II, a thrilling escape from the clutches of the Nazis, and a son's inspiring search for his father's legacy. Think of a, of a hybrid between the great escape and the field of dreams Brilliantly written, light reminds us that we are all still building our memories of World War II more than 75 years after the war. So that's Rob Satino, their senior military historian, and from, um, from Nick Mueller, who was one of the co-founders with uh, um, Stephen Ambrose and then the, the CEO there. He wrote, Tyler Bridges has given us a gripping story of the bravery, hero heroism, and ingenuity of his father. This book is a uh, must read for anyone interested in World War II. So um, I have nothing bad to say about the World War II Museum. Okay. By the way, let me just say is, is the way I ended up 
uh, I mentioned in my opening remarks, I, I, at one point I sort of faced a conundrum and I, I couldn't figure out how to get the book published. The way I decided to write it was uh, without, what I'm gonna say the next thing is I hope it doesn't sound pretentious, um, but I always remembered when I had read The Grapes of Wrath in high school, how um, Steinbeck would write several chapters and then he'd have kind of a, um, he'd kind of throw you a curveball and he'd have this chapter about something else. And then it'd be several more chapters of the story um, of the Jodes and then he'd have this other chapter about something else. So that was kind of what I was thinking about because as I was doing my research, some people told me, wow, that's a great story like about the Rosensteins. So that's a great story about this guy, Glenn Lovelett, who escaped with my, who was uh, on, the, on the lamb with my father. Um, and you ought to include that in the book. So the way I wrote it was, again, I'd have two or three chapters about my dad's story, and then I'd have what I called sort of the backstory chapter. Um, you know, a story about the, a chapter about the Hungarian doctor's um, twin sons who I met. And, but it just didn't work. And so I was at a loss for two or three years. Of, how do I go forward with this book? I've got most of the book is my dad's story, but people tell me it's really neat this backstory of how I kind of did the research and what I learned along the way. So um, this book I mentioned earlier called Long Shot, um, the, the, the book on the, how John Bell Edwards pulled it off in 2015. Uh, my co-author Jeremy Alford and I hired um, a, a guy that you may know and named Clancy Dubose um, to, to edit the book for us. And Clancy did a terrific job. He's a friend of mine. And so I, I decided to go back to Clancy um, for the flight. What do I do? Uh, I'm stuck. And Clancy came up with a brilliant solution, which was to divide the book into two parts. So part one of the book is my dad's story just straight told. And then part two begins with his funeral. Uh, again, which I mentioned, that's when the, the, the book uh, idea began. So book, part two is sort of the backstory. And then I, I, I end up concluding with some thoughts about, about my dad and, and how the research changed my thoughts about him. Um, so um, anyway, uh, people might find that, that, that sort of approach to be interesting. I think it's a really interesting, really interesting comment because one of the things we talk about as a group is, you know, how if we sit down to write a family story or part of our family story, you know, how do you convey that? And, you know, we're a lot of, um, you know, time and effort goes into kind of documenting the specifics of individual relatives and, you know, their connections to each other and connections between families. Uh, but to kind of carry forward that that real narrative for your your children and grandchildren you know thinking about how you kind of put all the pieces together is you know um something that comes up and you kind of you you want to be able to if you if you do want to write a story for them you know think about how those those people fit together and in that and construct a narrative to help uh convey that information that you found Wow. Yeah, Stephen, that, that, you know, for those of you who've done research, you know, there's, you know, the, what I end up doing writing a book, there's two parts to it, right? There's the research and there's the writing. But there's a real challenge with the research is how do you organize the research? Um, and as information is coming in, um, how do you make it, put it together in a way that you can, you can figure out later what's there? And it can be complicated because you can get papers. Like I got, as I mentioned, um, a sheaf of documents from the National Archives. So I've got paper. Um, there are emails that you get. Um, what, what do you do with that? Uh, how do you organize all this stuff? And I can't claim to have um, invented the best way, but I did find ultimately something that worked for me. Um, ultimately, I like to have stuff in a Word file because of it's so it's searchable, um, because I, I forget things. Um, but then there's also questions about, well, you know, should I create different word files? Then you can forget. I, I, at times, I even forget what different word files I have. I've created maybe I created one six months ago. Um, so it, it's a real challenge, uh, I think, to to stay on top of this stuff 
and to find out a way to organize your material in, in a way that works for you. Literally over the weekend, um, I ha had been meaning to email the, the various people in this country and around the world who would help me. Um, and I had just been working on this other book um, that's coming out later this year. So I never, I never got to that. So I, I promised myself I was gonna do it this weekend and doing the research, I remembered that I had gotten some photographs of some guys who, um, who had escaped with my father. I had gone to great lengths to find uh, one guy, he was in, uh, in Maine, uh, another guy in Canada, uh, you know, another family in New Zealand. And I ended up forgetting that I had those photographs. And I was just reminded of that this weekend. And so I'm kicking myself. Now it's too late. I, you know, I published the book and I had gone to great lengths to get these photographs and I just plumb forgot it. <laughs> so. Sure. Um, Colin, do you have a question? Yeah, I've got a couple of questions. Uh, one of them, would, would, which uh, prison camp was your father in? So my dad was not held in, a, in one of the traditional prison camp, prisoner war camps in Germany. But I did some research um, because he ended up inter intersecting um, with uh, some people who did. And I can't remember offhand, I'd have to look it up in the book, um, a couple of the ones that I mentioned, but God almighty, the amazing stories. And I told a couple of these in there, the, the incredible inventiveness of these pre prisoners of war and, and how they could create uh, fake passports how they could dig these tunnels right under the nose of the, pri the, the prison guards. And then once how they could escape and, and cause diversions. I mean, it's just remarkable, the ingenuity of these men, you know, 75 years ago. And, you know, if you remember the story of the great escape. Um, they were all shot. Uh, yeah, I think all but a couple of In real were life, shot. I think most of them were shot. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the... the it was a fun thing to be able to tell this, to learn about these stories about my, 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 these, these guys who escaped from Europe, I mean, from Germany or Poland uh, and made their way to Hungary where my dad was. But my dad um, was actually um, held in, um, he was, it was called an internee as reasons I explained in the book. And he was initially held in a chateau, then he was held in a castle, but he held end up, ended up being in Yugoslavia. And there he was held in a, a, a tr traditional, so was he in one of the Stalag Luft? No, those were only, I think, in, in Germany and, and, Poland, oh, okay. and Poland. So he was not. But the guys who, um, who were caught, uh, who had been in his crew, they were held in those, in those places. Well, how many years did, were, did, did you research this? So my dad died in 2003. I started my research in 2008. By about 2010, I had most of the story um, but I was not able to figure out a way to write the book in, in a way I could sell it. But I guess in the next two or three years, I did some more research. Um, but I, I'd say the intensive research took a couple of years. Um, again, just firing off a lot of emails um, and, and hoping for the goodness of people to, uh, to come through for me. And, and most people did. It's, ter it's terrific. Um, one, one of the really interesting stories is kind of follow up on Colin's question was, um, you know, that how your father went from that lifestyle in the in Hungary before the Germans invaded and sort of took over. As you tell him, you tell that story in the book and how your father kind of it was kind of a decent existence. Yeah, he lived um, with other other men who were prisoners of war there, but uh, they had a little bit more freedom than, than you would otherwise think in, in that area. Um, but then, you know, as he made his escape from there after the, and kind of wound up being, um, you know, as you say, interned in that, in that camp, I think it was near Belgrade in yeah. Yugoslavia. <laughs> this just awful place uh, and, you know, uh, to go from those conditions to ones where he's basically just, you know, just trying to survive in that, in that camp. And then, um, you know, his, his escape from that 
situation. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about how he, you know, how he did it and then how you piece that piece of it together. I mean, how was that all on his records that he, he documented after he made it safely back to Italy or did you have to? Yeah, I, I don't want to give, I don't want to give all the details away because I hope people sure. still want to maybe want to buy the book. And by the way, um, if anybody wants to buy it, they can buy it at amazon.com. I also sell books directly to people and can sign them if anybody wants to. They can go to my, my webpage, which is tylerbridges.com. So um, again, I, that way I can autograph a book if somebody wants it. Um, again, tylerbridges.com. But um, yeah, those my, my dad was blessed with a very good memory. Um, and so uh, he was able to tell his story in, in extraordinarily good detail, which was very, very helpful. But I'll tell you one of the things that, that in my research, I'd be you know, finding out something about my dad and he was in a certain place and I'd come across somebody's name and then I'd have to figure out, I'd have to do research on that person. I'd have to do research on that place. Um, I did, for example, an, uh, a lot of research because my dad was in Hungary on what was going on in Hungary at that time. And he ends up in Yugoslavia and I did a lot of research on what was going on in Yugoslavia at that time because to tell his story properly, I had to tell the, the, the story of uh, the context of you know, what was happening in those different places. And you know, fortunately, um, I, I guess you all like history. I like history. <laughs> uh, and so uh, it was really fascinating uh, to learn about these new subjects and then you know, hopefully learn about it enough way to be able to tell it um, in, an engrossing, in an engrossing way. I'll answer one more question, but then uh, if anybody has one, then I want to tell you about my next book. Um, do we have any other questions from the group? Um, uh, Casey, uh, I think you're muted. You're muted. Colin's got his hand up. He's had his hand up for a while. Um, no, I'm, I'm done. Oh. Okay. Okay. So um, my next book is coming out November 1st. Um, are there any college football fans out there? <laughs> All right. At least a couple of you are college football fans. So I have a book coming out in November on the craziest finish ever to a college football game. Can anybody guess? And if the answer does not involve LSU, does anybody guess what was the craziest finish ever to a college football game? What is that, Larry? Um, I can think of, I can think of one. Um, Crazy. Else is, anyone else has any, any thoughts? Is that one Alabama no. at the end of the game? No, nope. no. Nope. It's not quick. Auburn, Alabama. No, no, that was remarkable, not crazy. <laughs> <laughs> um, my, my guess is it has something to do with Stanford. So Stanford and Cal, they play what's called the big game. And 40 years ago this fall was the craziest finish ever to a college football game. And I encourage you, if you care, you can go online, do a, a video search for Stanford Cal. There's a 47 second version of it. If you want the really good version, you get the six minute and 48 second version of Cal and Stanford in the 1982 big game. Um, and, and that six minute and 48 second version begins with Stanford down by two points, two points with its hated rival Cal. And a quarterback is facing a fourth and 17 with 53 seconds left on his own 13 yard line. Somehow he's got to get the first down, keep the drive going within 53 seconds to kick a field goal to try to win the game. And the quarterback was playing his final game for Stanford. His name was John Elway. Mm -hmm. So I write this book. It's, I did 375 interviews. I copied 1,500 newspaper articles on the 1982 season for Cal and Stanford. When I copied those articles, I got a PDF. I had a, what's called OCR where they were all converted into Word but each of those articles had garble. So for, it took me over a year. Every day I would do three or four articles and get rid of the garble by comparing the, the original PDF with the Word file. But I got then a whole search, searchable Word file. 
So I ended up piecing together the story. The book is coming out, as I said, on November 1st. It's called Five Laterals and a Trombone, Cal Stanford and the Wildest Finish Ever in College Football. Mm. And uh, this fellow, John Elway, who went on, you know, if you're a football fan, you recognize his name, perhaps. He went on to be a Hall of Fame quarterback. Um, he has written the forward for the book along with the a famous guy for Cal that day who went on to be an NFL head coach. He's now the coach in Washington. So I'm excited about that book, um, all the work I did. Um, so anyway, it's, it was a fun project. Great. And that is, I remember, I remember watching that um, and it's one of the most amazing finishes. I mean, it's just- uh... The most amazing finish in college football history um, but let me just, thanks for having me. And I salute all of you in, in your research endeavors. As you can see that I sort of jump from different, to different topics, but I have a passion for telling the story, uh, getting to know the story. And I'm guessing that each of you in your own way um, have that same passion. So I salute all the work that you guys are doing. Thank you. And th thank you for taking the time tonight to um, be with us and tell us you know, about the flight. Uh, it's just recommend everybody, if you have an interest in World War II history or uh, just want to read a great story. I mean, it's, it's just a, the level of detail that you put into the book really brings it alive. And I think it's kind of inspiring for us as we're trying to, you know, think about our own relatives who maybe have not you know, done something as dramatic as your father did, but um, have some really interesting family stories that we, you know, we love to tell each other and the chance to, <coughs> write those down and share those with our other relatives is you know something we encourage everyone to do and um but thank thank you again tyler for for doing this tonight thank you my pleasure thanks for your time y'all okay. thanks very much okay well we'll go ahead and conclude tonight um and we're right at about eight o'clock and so i wanted to thank everybody for who who joined us tonight and uh, we will be back in the fall. Uh, this we're going to take a, our usual summer break, um, we're hope, and then we're going to plan ahead for September. And hopefully, you know, fingers crossed, if the pandemic remains under control, which you know, given the news lately, you just don't know what's going to happen. But if everything stays under control, we'll try and get back to an in-person meeting um, in September. And we'll definitely try to do something like what we're doing tonight. So if you are, if you are one of our out of town members, uh, we will try to have the Zoom feed so that you can watch the live meeting um, over Zoom and be able to engage with us that way. And you'll be able to ask questions in that format as well. So we'll be working you know, hopefully we can get back into the Jefferson Parish Library or to another venue and um, be able to set that up. So uh, just encourage everybody to keep, you know, stay engaged with us as we make this transition. And um, you know, if there's any questions, you know, feel free to reach out to me. Um, but I'll go ahead and conclude tonight. And thanks again for, for joining. <laughs>